So the comprehensive plan was completed on um, September 7th, 2010. So um, when we started the plan, we started it by creating um, what is known um, as branding. So we created this logo, um, and everything that we did had this logo on it so people knew that that was part of the, uh, the planning process. So we created a logo, um, and we used it, and we tried to capture everything that was involved in that, the, the land and the sea, because most of everything in Queen Anne's County really has to do with the land and the sea. So, um, <laughs> as Jack mentioned, it is a blueprint, and we, we do look at it that way when we're doing it because we, we, do it, we look at it comprehensively. So, when you're looking at a blueprint, you have to include everything in it. So, it's kind of a, a broad-based brush of where things are going to go. It's not really detailed. It's broad. So, it's going to say, so what's in that blueprint? It's where you may place houses in the community, where you um, businesses locations um, and commercial uses can happen, uh, parks and rural uses, um, industrial uh, institutional uses where the churches and the schools can go, and then industrial uses. So when we talk about the rural uses, we're talking about agriculture as well. So those are the kind of broad land use categories that we do when we're doing comprehensive plans. Um, we do consider infrastructure or where we want to create infrastructure when we're doing it, um, where major transportation arteries are, like 301, Route 50, and things like that. So you'll you'll. Essentially, planners at the very beginning will sit down with a, with a, with a big pl plan and we'll sit down, we did this with our CAC, where do we want to grow? Where should things be? How is this going to work? And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. We came up with a, a, a purple blob in the north part of the county that was supposed to be a new um, industrial area that didn't quite fly. <laughs> People are laughing. You remember the purple blob? Okay. Um, that was very controversial. <laughs> So, why do we plan? We plan, um, Maryland established through state enabling legislation the right and the obligation uh, for jurisdictions that city, towns, and counties within the state to create plans and implementing tools. So the plan is the vision, the goals, the objectives, the tools are zoning, subdivision regulations, environmental code, you know, um, stormwater management, all of those things contribute to implementing the plan. The plan is the vision, and then we create the tools to implement it. And the, the tools have to, according to state law and actually according to um, state law that I'm going to show you, has to be um, consistent with the plan. So the, the tools, it can't say that there's going to be agriculture here and then uh, the, plant, the zoning says they're going to be industrial. That's, that's inconsistent. It has to be consistent. And there was state, um, there was a state uh, huge uh, case on that, legal case, and then the state legislature went ahead and reaffirmed that the consistency between the plan and the zoning and subdivision regulations. So that was done in 2009. So land use article, it used to formerly known as the 66B, um, is of the annotated code outlines the requirements expressed in visions and elements for creating the comprehensive plan. And that little that little book there is is the plan is the land use article. So. People will say 66B, it's, it's in Article 66B, or we have to do this. It, it also means the land use article. So I wanted to just do a brief re review of Maryland planning laws. And the reason I want you to do that is for you to understand, um, as we do as planners, um, what a joy it is to be in Maryland, because there's no other state in the union that has as much uh, planning backbone as we do in Maryland, and it, it's quite considerable. In fact, planners, when they graduate from planning school, actually seek out to come to Maryland because Maryland is known as a planning state. So, 19, I'm going to start with 84 because that was a major, um, actually, it was a huge change in land use in the state. It was, and it was nationally known. Um, in 1984, the Chesapeake Bay Protection Act, which is um, known as the Critical Area Act, 
was passed. It was enacted in 87. In other words, all of the plans and the drawings and the designations of where critical area was going to be had to be completed by 87. But the, the act was actually passed in 84. And it adds um, uh, additional protections for lands within 1,000 feet of tidal waters of the Chesapeake Bay. So that 1,000 feet is, is um, noted, and there's a map over here that shows um, where critical area is in Queen Anne's County. We have considerable amount of crit critical area, not only on Kent Island, but all throughout the coastal region of the county, which is considerable, have f over 450 miles of coast in Queen Anne's County. Um, Talbot County, I think, is the only one that has more than we do. Um, so, in 1992 was kind of, I, I consider, the, the, the rolling out of some really very, very distinct and um, very detailed planning acts. 1992 Planning Act identified seven goals um, of protection of land, businesses, and um, resources in the county, and then they added a, an eighth goal in 1997 with smart growth and neighborhood conservation, which actually um, created, you know, I would look at 97 as an implementing tool to 92 because in 92 it said that we all had to do comprehensive plan. There wasn't really anything that, you know, there was, there were laws before that, but it, it got very discreet in 92 and said that you had to do a plan and you had to update it every six years and you actually had to review everything and, and bring all your demographics up and all your, um, all your information. Um, in 1997, it said not only do you have to update your plan and your demographics and all of the um, infrastructure and things like that, your community facilities, your parks, you have to designate where growth areas are. And then when you do that, you need to create what's called priority funding areas. So um, I can't walk away from this thing. <laughs> I'm going to walk away. I want to show you. So when we did this, we, um, we, we created six growth areas in the county. And we did this based on a growth pattern and also where we had infrastructure. So the first growth areas were Chester and then Stevensville. Then the next one is Kent Narrows and then Graysonville. And then we went to Queenstown and Centerville. Two incorporated municipalities, the rest are um, within the county uh, unincorporated area. So we designated six growth areas. Um, and, and that also included priority funding areas. Priority funding area is kind of an interesting animal because it's really a state animal. It has nothing to do with our land use patterns in as much as it doesn't really give us anything. But what it does is that if you're in a priority funding area and you need state funding, um, if you're not in a priority funding area, you will not get any state funding. To, to this point, I'll, I'll give you an example of how, how tight the state looks at it. We were doing um, the uh, 304 overpass, which all of you, I'm sure, are aware of, um, a huge uh, benefit to this county, um, 304 overpass over three, Route 301. And we were in the kind of the end stages, you know, 10 years ago of doing the final design for that. And I got a call from the state, and they said, um, well, we've got a problem. And I said, oh, yeah, what's the problem? They said, well, not all of the right-of-way is in a PFA. I went, well, you're the state, come on, I mean, you know, fix it. And they said, no, you have to fix it. So we went through the process, but it took us nine months to go through the process of adding areas so the state could give itself money to build that bridge, and I mean, that overpass. And it was really quite, um, quite interesting, the process, because I, I was, uh, you know, and I'm a planner and I work for the t county and I was going, why do we have to do this? Because it's state funding going for a state project, but it didn't meet the criteria. It wasn't in a PFA. So we had to add the area um, around um, the beaver farm and the Kudner farm and things like that so that all of the right of way that the overpass is in is now in a priority funding area and the state funds could be allocated to that project. 
Um, so that was that was an interesting learning experience because um, it it meant first the state is very serious about where they give their dollars and that they want to make sure that the priority funding areas are in growth areas and things like that. So that was that was an interesting experience. So the, so that 1997 act was very very important because it led to us being able to um, designate those growth areas and then we would actually get resources for those growth areas when we need them and and we've we've been somewhat successful in doing that and um, in allocating f funds sometimes our businesses also need um, they can get um, uh, resources because if they create a number of jobs, we can get um, tax benefits and things like that. So PFAs are very, very important. So designated growth areas and PFAs in 97. In 2006, House Bill 1141, and it for some reason has always held that House Bill 1141 designation, was really pretty revolutionary in as much as it was really intended as a bill to make sure that towns and counties talk to each other because there was a, a big case in Caroline County where Denton annexed 900 acres on the other side of the river um, to grow in those 900 acres, and the t county didn't think that they should do that. So they challenged them. And what happened was um, this law came about, which is, was originally about the annexation law. It came about that said that the municipal growth element has to be um, reviewed and the county and town have to talk and agree about it. And that was very, very important in, um, you know, as a result of that act in 2006. Um, but then what happened was MDE, Maryland Department of the Environment, said we need watershed planning and we need you, the counties to do that. So we're going to add the water resources element to the comprehensive planning process. And that really was quite an incredible, it wasn't just a little thing, it was a huge thing. So it meant that we had to assess in all of our watersheds um, what if we had available water and wastewater and protection of resources in those, wa in those um, watersheds and if we were going to contribute to the degradation of those watersheds with the development. And that meant that we had to evaluate. We have 12 eight-digit watersheds in Queen Anne's County. So we had to evaluate where we were growing, how we were growing, if we had enough resources in terms of water and sewer, um, and if our stormwater management regulations were going to meet and protect the waters of our county. And we did that, but it, it was not a small thing to do. And the, the appendix in the, um, in the uh, 2010 comprehensive plan that has to do with that is, is about 100 pages, just to do with um, the water resource element. The next act was um, updating the Critical Area Act of 2008. And that update was very, very important because what it did was it allowed the um, Critical Area Commission to create regulations. And those regulations have to do with lot coverage, with uh, creating buffer management plans, and really advancing what was done in 84 to protect the bay. So what they had looked at from 84 to 2008, the, um, the protection of the bay, the water quality was not getting where they wanted to go. And one of the major things is runoff from, our pro from, the, um, from, the from the land to the water. And so doing buffer management plans and things like that was, were very, very important. So, so if you're doing any development activities now, new development activities on your property in critical area, um, and you don't have a vegetated buffer on the water, um, you're going to have to put trees in and bushes, and you're going to have to vegetate it so that the water will um, not run into it. The other thing that it said that if you're in critical area, and I have to say Queen Anne's County was ahead in this, if you're in critical area, you have to have a best available technology septic system. But Queen Anne's County had passed that a couple of years before that you had to have a BAT, a best available technology. So, um, 
I will say that the um, there there were environmental regulations that were also passed in the in the early um, around 2005 2006. That's called the flush tax. It's that extra sixty dollars you get if you're on a septic system and thirty five if you're on a um, on your tax bill. That flush tax actually has been very very helpful in Queen Anne's County because it's allowed us to go into critical area and repair failing septic systems. So you know that's been very very important. So. Planning logs continued because Maryland is Maryland and we do planning. <laughs> 2009, the Smart Green and Growing legislation, uh, Smart Sustainable Growth Act, um, it added, um, it changed all the visions. So there are 12 visions now in the, um, in the uh, state, uh, in the state um, land use article. Um, and it, it said that we had to, and actually you're gonna see this this year because we're gonna do it as part of our five year report, there are, it said that we had to do something called measures and indicators. So we had to measure what we're doing. We say in our plans that we're going to, you know, have these goals and objectives, but, and, and you'll see if you have a chance to, and I hope you do pick up a, a CD of the comprehensive plan, you're gonna see that every, um, every section, there's eight sections in the plan, has a measures and indicator on that. So how do we measure what we're doing? How do we, uh, and what are the indicators? So, um, and the, the, 2000, the 2009 Smart Green and Growing was a, was a reaction to uh, the case that I talked to you about, Terrapin Run, which was out in Allegheny County. And it was to, it said specifically that the comprehensive plan and the implementing tools have to be consistent. And they, they, they cannot, the plan can't say one thing and then the zoning say something else. It's just not going to work. And um, I, I'll show you that later. 2012 Sustainable Growth and Agricultural Protection Act, and um, also known as the Septic Bill, um, was pretty dramatic for us because um, it actually restricts what we can do in, in our, our rural area, and let me show you where our rural area is in Queen Anne's County. This is our rural area in Queen Anne's County. 88% of the county is rural. So that, that um, the um, septic bill restricts to minor subdivisions that, um, that a large property can have. It's, and we were allowed to increase our minor subdivisions from five lots to seven lots, which we did, um, as Queen Anne's County did. So we can have a minor subdivision. Um, anything larger than a minor would have to be on a shared system, and we don't have provisions in the county for shared systems. So I will say that, um, thanks a lot, I don't want to hit that. It's hard for me not to walk around, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. Um, but. Um, I would, I would like to say there are a number of, um, you might see, and I, I get these calls a lot, is that, you know, they're developing out in the rural area. We did have a lot of, uh, lots of record um, that were done. Um, we had a lot of subdivisions come through to the county when everybody else had a lot of subdivisions coming through um, between 2002 and 2008 you know, and nine. Um, there were lots of subdivisions. And what happened was, which was really interesting, was that um, pretty much um, our growth areas were shut down for residential growth, so it kind of got pushed out into the rural area, which was uh, to some extent unfortunate. But um, anyway, so we, we do have lots of record. Just be aware that those people that have those lots of record are paying taxes on them. So, <laughs> um, and so those lots of record are starting slowly as, as the real estate market starts to pick up. Um, they are starting to, you're going to see, you know, some developments up on 213 that were platted and, and approved many years ago are starting to build out. So, um, so it restricts that. So new subdivisions of larger than seven lots are not going to be happening in Queen Anne's County. But not only because of, of the state law, it's also because of the APFO. Our adequate public facilities ordinance does not allow um, a, 
a larger, larger than six lots, that's a little bit different than our um, minor subdivision, unless they go through an adequate public facility study. And what happened was we had, um, we had inadequacies at our high schools. So if you have two high schools and they're both inadequate, where are you gonna develop? Because we can't show that we had space in our high schools for those children that were gonna be in those homes to go through our high school. So we, that was um, kind of a, um, a growth management tool that we've had in the county since um, 2000 was an adequate uh, public facilities ordinance. And the adequate public facilities ordinance has to do with three things. Um, schools, and you have to determine that they're adequate. adequate. Um, water and sewer, and I'm a sewer, water and sewer, schools, water and sewer, fire and police. Yeah, well, transportation, sorry, it's not fire and police, thank you, <laughs> I don't know why I lost that. Transportation, so if you're growing in the growth area or actually anywhere in the county and, and um, you have to show that the roads are adequate, it's not a problem usually any place else but Ken Island. Ken Island, we have inadequacies. Um, and so we have mitigation fees for that. So I'm not, I don't want to go down the APFO um, road too much, but I did want to talk a little bit. So, um, so the septic bill had, um, it kind of reinforced what was already going on in Queen Anne's County. Um, and so even though we, we did change our subdivision, re, um, minor subdivision regulations, other than that, it didn't really have that big of an impact on us. And then new environmental regulations for septic systems. Now, if, you, um, if you're developing anywhere in Queen Anne's County, you have to use best available technology for your septic system, um, which means it depends on your soils. So you might have to use a drip irrigation system. You might have to do, um, you know, um, whatever, whatever the best available technology to treat the waste. And then the... Um, other um, mandates that came down were watershed implementation plan, a WIP, that, and the WIP essentially says that we have to um, we have to stop the degradation of our waterways because all of our waterways are impaired. So all those 12-digit watersheds all have total maximum daily loads. And the total maximum daily loads, not to get too technical, is your pollution diet. It actually tells you how much pollution the waterways can take without getting degraded. So we have TMDLs, the bay has a TMDL, and the watershed implementation plan is gonna help us improve the waters of the bay. And we have done an amazing job, along with um, doing those septic systems that I said that were in critical area, repairing those. We do, um, we do uh, I don't know, about 60 or 80 a year of those with the funds we have. And then um, we do vegetated buffers, and we've done those in the towns. Um, we work with the farmers to do uh, best management practices. So there's a whole, there's a whole bevy of um, opportunities that we've been using in order to improve the waterways and the runoff into the waterways. With, and we've been working with the soil conservation districts as well as our towns. So. And then the last thing is Plan Maryland. And Plan Maryland is probably uh, has, um, is, is just following what the county has done. In other words, we did our comprehensive plan and then Plan Maryland. We will adopt the, the um, visions of Plan Maryland as we go forward. Um, Commissioner Bucky referenced that we have a comprehensive plan. Our plan is, um, and I referenced the 1992 Planning Act, the plan is good for 10 years. So we would start probably to relook at the comprehensive plan in, in 2018. The process that we did in, um, in that created the 2010 plan took three years. Um, and I'm, we'll have to look at it when we get that far, when we go a few years down the road. Um, it was a very intense process. So uh, the Board of County Commissioners, this board will decide how they want to approach reviewing the comprehensive plan, but it's not due to be reviewed um, until 2010. Let's see if I can adjust these things. The 2020, sorry. <laughs> so I, this is Queen Anne's County's plans through time. So, um, and the plan got bigger because of all those laws I just talked about. 
we had to have them all. I had a vision when, we, when I started the 2010 Comprehensive Plan, and I, I kept telling all the staff, I want a small plan. I want a small plan. I just want everybody to be able to take it with them and know everything. But you just couldn't. <laughs> I mean, it's, that's my small plan. <laughs> So it has, um, it, as I said, it has eight parts, parts to it. But um, I wanted to talk about what the plan does. And the plan does, it creates relationships. And if it's the one thing that I would say, and many of the people that are sitting here are part of that relationship, it creates the relationships between the citizens and the planning commission um, through the planning process. Um, this was the first time I think we've had a planning process where we asked all the planning commission members to participate with the CAC and with all the topic committees. So they were very, very involved because I've been through planning processes before um, in other counties that I worked at where, you know, staff and citizens go off and write a plan and then they bring it back to the Planning Commission, and the Planning Commission had no clue what was going on, and there was total disconnect. So we wanted this to be the most connected plan that we could possibly have. And the Planning Commission's relationship with the county commissioners, because uh, through the comprehensive plan approval process, that's a very, very important relationship that happens. Um, and the planning relationship between the Queen Anne's County and its towns, Queen Anne's County has eight municipalities within it, um, Queenstown, Centerville, Queen Anne, Churchill, Southersville, Millington, Barclay, and Templeville. Now, if you didn't know about five of those, I'd understand because they're really small. I think uh, Templeville has like 80 citizens. Um, maybe Queen Anne has as much. Um, and um, Millington is also in um, Kent County. Templeville is also in Caroline County, so we share some borders with some other counties. Each town has its own comprehensive plan, and we reference that comprehensive plan in our plan. So they, we will reference the growth areas and, and um, annexation areas that they identify. And because of that, um, House Bill 1141 in 2006, their plans come to us. We have 30 days to review their plans, and we um, have to have a meeting with the planning commission from the town and the county planning commission. So it's really important, and I will say that um, there's pr there in House Bill 1141, there are provisions for mediation. So if you don't agree, if the town and the county don't agree, they, they go to mediation and, so and work it out. And sometimes that works, and sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> The process for creating the 2010 Comprehensive Plan. Start with where you are so you know where you're going. So it, it, seems, it seems logical. So what we do is called an existing condition study, and we do it um, with every plan that we do. So in, in order to know where we are, we do an existing conditions study. So what we did was a, a trends and indicators report. So we looked from 2002, and actually we looked from 2000 because um, that's when the census was. And um, actually what's really good is that now that we're doing planning, we can, in a 10-year cycle, we can do it with the census, really, because we get an incredible amount of information from the census. And then what we did, instead of just reporting to you what the census told us, how many people, there was 48,108 when I was doing it, um, it tells us what is the trend. If I look back 10 years, what does this mean? How, where are we going in the trends? Where are we going um, with the growth and things like that? So this, this document has a lot of very important analysis in it. And then we did an economic report. And what we did was, we also did very interestingly enough, because we wanted to know, one of the directives that I got from the Board of County Commissioners was, we need more um, economic development, we need more areas for, for economic growth. So we did what we called a gap analysis in here. So what we did was we um, tested to see what type of businesses we needed. 
um, in the county? Where were our gaps? Where were people traveling out of Queen Anne's County because they couldn't find a business in Queen Anne's County? So we, that was part of this, but also the trends and indicators as well. So, so we, we, then we knew where we were, and then we presented all of this to the committees that worked on it. Engaging the citizens in the planning process. So what we did was we sent out a letter, um, a newsletter. I need a lot of props. <laughs> to 19,000 households. And this newsletter said, the comprehensive planning is starting and we want you to come out and tell us what you want. And what we did was, um, what you see up there are, are um, the meeting at the um, Sudlersville, um, which is now, that's kind of neat too. Um, it was the Sudlersville Middle School, which was the old middle school. Now there's a new middle school, which is so neat. That was the old middle school. Um, and what we did was um, we presented um, an online survey, we did a visual preference survey, and we did what's called a SWOT which is strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And we did that with over 400 citizens. And we got our, our Bible of what to do. Um, and that was, that was very, very impressive. From that, we asked people to um, fill out a form to see if they wanted to participate in either the Citizens Advisory Committee or the topic committees. And we had, <laughs> We had 135 people that volunteered. Um, and the way we worked it, which I thought was really neat, was that you had to come to a large community meeting in order to qualify to be on the committee. So in other words, you had to go through the visioning process that we were doing, the visual preference, the online survey, in order to, to participate in the committee. So you knew what you were getting into, kind of. And so, um, so 400 citizens participated in the community meetings. We had over 1,000 citizens complete the online survey and the visual preference survey. And this picture here is at Ken Island High School where we're doing the SWOT analysis. And we did that using um, um, automatic clickers. So it would say, um, of these preferences, what do you want? You would, everybody in the room would click, and then we'd have the immediate answer come up. So we, we used some uh, keypad technology that was really, really, it gave a lot of good feedback immediately to the citizens. Um, so we created six committees and the CAC. The CAC dealt mostly with land use, the overall vision of the land use. We had a resource conservation and environmental protection committee. We had an infrastructure committee, which really dealt with um, kind of your, um, all of your um, water and sewer, your, um, where those things were gonna go. Um, also um, had to do with um, stormwater management, things like that. Town, county. This was really critical. We've never done this before, and, and you won't find this in many other jurisdictions' plans. We have a town, county framework in our, in our, um, in our comprehensive plan, and that was to work out agreements with our towns about where to grow, what they needed, and what we needed, and and that was very, very important to us. In fact, if I were to say what was the most important element of all the elements in this, it would have been the relationship we were trying to foster with our towns, very important. And then business and economic development, agriculture and um, uh, rural preservation. And Jay, do you see yourself there? <laughs> you're, you're there, that was the Ag Committee that I took the picture of um, that we met and they were sitting with a big map um, looking, at <laughs> looking at trying to figure out um, and one of our planning commission members there, um, and uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so and then historic and cultural preservation. So we had those committees. Um, so the citizens developed an advisory report. So I, I think if you haven't gotten it now, I really want you to understand how much of a citizen-driven pro project the comprehensive plan was. It really was. So we had a report from the CAC and the topic committees reviewed by the planning commission and then the comprehensive plan is developed. So what happened was that, and I have to say we had these huge 11 by 17 sheets and the planning commission went through every recommendation, every um, object, um, 
um, objective, every goal, everything that every committee came up with. And we had them categorized and everything else. And um, I can remember going through those sheets. So it was very, very intense. But while this was going on, the county commissioners, because of legislation that had been introduced, created what was called a blue ribbon panel. And if you ask me what my worst day was, was when I got a call from Greg, who told me that the county commissioners at their county meeting that night created a blue ribbon panel <laughs> on um, smart growth and rural preservation. And I, I kind of said, well, what am I doing? <laughs> And it actually turned out to be the best thing that could have happened for the comprehensive plan. Because um, what happened was this blue ribbon panel was very selected with people from the towns, um, from the ag community, from the business community, um, and from the conservation community. And many of them actually are here in this room that were on that, that panel. And they all sat down. And what they were looking at was the issue of development in the county, the growth. And we hammered out um, 20 recommendations. Um, and those recommendations were all incorporated into the comprehensive plan. So while we had recommendations from the citizens, we had a special panel. And for some reason, it, you know, you have to say that it has to be the time and it has to be the place. It just worked because this, our, our citizens advisory committee accepted the, the panel's um, um, uh, most of the panel's recommendations, not, uh, there were 20 recommendations. I don't think some of them were um, um, duplicative and other ones were already incorporated into the plan, but the majority of them were included. So that was an interesting twist that I wouldn't have anticipated, but it, it all worked and everybody worked really hard. So the adoption process is the comprehensive plan is sent to the state and the adjoining jurisdictions for a 60 day review. So the plan gets reviewed by um, all the adjoining jurisdictions and all the state agencies, transportation, Department of Planning, Department of, um, of uh, Maryland Department of the Environment, Maryland Department of uh, um, uh, DNR, Department of Natural Resources, and they, and they all send you comments. And then we have public hearings, and all those comments and issues that are brought up are, are then reviewed again by the planning commission and planning staff and changes are made to the plan as appropriate. And then the, co the county commissioners hold a public, uh, then what happens is the plan is finalized and approved by the Queen Anne's County Planning Commission. One of the things that's really um, hard to understand but is the way the law is written is that the planning commission creates the plan the county commissioners adopt the plan, but the planning commission creates it. And technically, the county commissioners can't change the plan um, substantively without it going back to the planning commission. It's a, it, it's, it's a check and balance that we have in our state law. So the county uh, planning commission um, approved and sent a favorable recommendation to the county commissioners on the plan. The county commissioners held a public, um, hold a public hearing and, and then adopt the comprehensive plan. And we didn't have any back and forth, which was really nice. Um, what happened was the county uh, commissioners, um, through resolution, had uh, some minor changes in the plan, but nothing substantive. And it was adopted on September 7th. So. The only other thing I wanted to go over tonight, because I'm I really talk too much, uh, <laughs> I want to talk about. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the goals and things, but I did want to talk about the difference between the comprehensive plan and the zoning, because I have I I started a plan in Y Mills with a group of citizens, and I got like th into the third meeting, and I realized that the citizens thought they were writing zoning and they didn't know they were writing a plan. And it's, it, I understand it, but how are you gonna understand it? So what we did was in our plan, we decided, and the first thing that we said to all of our citizens topic committees is that we're doing planning, we're doing visioning. And one of the things that I'd like you to take away from this is that the plan is an intention. What it is is we intend to do this and how we intend to do it. The zoning, the zoning is how we intend to do it. 
The plan says we intend that we're going to have preserve our rural areas, we're going to grow in Chester Stevensville, we're going to do this. The zoning is how we implement it, the subdivision regulations. They're the detail. So uh, the plan is the guide that expresses long-range goals and objectives, some of which may or not be realized for years. So the plan, when, when one of my professors, when I was doing planning, said, I want you, when you're doing planning, to think 100 years in the future. Not 10, not 30, 100 years. Because if you don't think 100 years in the future, you know, Conquest Beach wouldn't be there, Central Park wouldn't be there, all sorts of Rockville Park wouldn't be there. They, they started that in 1890. So anyway, I'm just saying that you really need to vision. You really need to think out when you're doing planning. The plan is generalized and flexible in many respects. Again, it says the intention. The plan addresses both private development and public need for community facilities and infrastructure. And the plan recommends the use of land, but not how the land will be developed. So. This is a land use map. So this says where we have residential areas, where we have rural business employment areas, where we have preserved lands, where we have town county growth areas, and incorporated towns. So it's a land use plan. It's not a zoning map. But if you're in this green area and you want to put a commercial business, unless it's agriculture, um, and agriculturally related, you can't do it. You have to be in the growth area or where we, our land use designates that. So I just want to make sure. Zoning regulations are related to present and are detailed laws pertaining to the use of property. So they're very detailed. If I show you my, my zoning for agriculture, it has 37 different uses in it. Um, you can have an auction house, you can have a, a country inn, you can have um, a kennel, you can have, um, um, you know, you can have a, uh, you know, a horse farm, all sorts of things. You can have bees um, and things like that. <laughs> but, um, and so you can, that's what the farm, that's what it says. And you have all of those 37 uses. You have some really interesting uses. You might look at them um, in the ag zone. But if you're, but if you're in, the, in the commercial area, you're not going to be able to have all those 37 uses. You're not going to be able to have a, a town center. You're not going to be able to have an auction house. It's, no, it's not. So it's very specific. Um, zoning is precise, especially with respect to boundaries of the various zoning districts. So, this is a generalized map, so if you go there and you say, well, this is going to, if it looks, you can't tell which land use it is because it's on the border, zoning is very specific. We have 81 zoning maps in the county, and it's very distinct of where um, neighborhood conservation is, where town center is, where urban commercial is, where suburban commercial is, all of those zones, very specific. Um, and it also determines permitted uses within those zones, allowed densities, how many houses can be put on a piece of property, setbacks, regulations for new development. All of those are there. Zoning primarily relates to the use of private property, um, but can accommodate public uses. So when I talked about institutional uses, the schools and things like that, most of our, um, most of our zones accommodate institutional uses. So that would be the public uses. And then when development is planned to occur, zoning is the law that determines what can be done in terms of the type of use, density, setbacks, and, and open space, and other factors. So if you really want to know what you can do on your property, you go to zoning. If you want to know what can happen in your neighborhood or, or, or in a whole other area, you go to um, the generalized plan, the, the plan. Or if you're thinking what's happening in, in the north part of the county or something, look at the intention. Or you want to know what's going to happen in, um, you know, a, um, in economic development. What is the vision for the county for economic development? It's, it's all outlined in the plan. 
So um, I did want to, I, I want to end my talk with um, the vision. Um, and you'll see that there are nine visions around, um, the, around the boards. These, all of these visions, um, the first vision was created by the Board of County Commissioners. Um, but all the other visions that were created for the different sections were created by the citizens. So all of these visions were incorporated into the, into the um, plan. And all of these visions have goals, objectives, and res recommendations. And as you go down from the goals and objectives to recommendations, they get more and more detailed with the intention for those. For those. And um, I'd like to um, go ahead and read one of them, but I definitely want to read the first one, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try not to get feedback here. So. And this, this, was, this was, I put this in the RFP when we hired a consultant to assist us with um, the 67 public meetings that we had to do the comprehensive plan. So the vision is to continue the ethic that the county remains quintessentially, quintessential rural community with an overall character of the county preserved as a predominantly rural county with small towns connected by creeks and county roads through fields and forest a great place to live. A county that encourages agriculture, seafood, and maritime industries, tourism and outdoor sports, small business, and high-tech enterprises, a good place to work. A county that is a faithful steward to its natural and cultural heritage, a good neighbor for the Bay and other Eastern Shore counties. A county in which development does not impair the quality of life enjoyed by all, a county, a community that protects the expectations and opportunities of all of its citizens, a county that supports the highest quality of education that seeks to fully prepare its citizens for the future. That was the starting point of everything we did throughout all of the, of the planning process. Um, and the land use vision, this was done by the uh, Citizens Advisory Committee, was that Queen Anne's County be the rural county that plans for orderly growth to protect and sustain a primarily agricultural, forested, and maritime community within the limits of natural resources by concentrated future growth in existing towns and population centers and preserves the county's natural beauty and resources for future generations. The county will em emphasize preservation of rural character of Queen Anne's County through the support of agriculture as an industry and to preserve the equity that exists in agricultural lands. And we did that when we did the plan. We really worked on making sure that the, agri that the equity was there. I would say that the septic bill kind of maybe undid some of that, but we certainly did. Queen Anne's County is also a county that values and protects its water resources and is conscious of its stewardship of the land and other natural assets and resources and makes a great place to live, work, and play. So if you're wondering where live, work, and play came from, um, priority preservation areas has visions, and I'm going to not read them all to you because you can have the opportunity to read them yourself. But they're all, um, what's so precious about all of them is that they were all developed by the citizens. Um, and none of these, um, when we, we sent it up to the Planning Commission or the County Commissioners, none of these visions were changed. They all remained as part of an integral part. And all of the things that happened from there were all made to make sure those recommendations, the objectives, the goals, we made sure that they all were compatible with the intent behind those visions. Okay. Um, so this was to, to kind of int introduce you to the comprehensive plan. Um, it's a very big document, but it's very readable, and it's also got a lot of great information in it. 